Today is an incredible day in which we mark a milestone moment on this historic mission to inspire America. Today, gathered in the middle of our great country, we officially break ground on a long overdue project, but one it seems we need now more than ever. This place will be an eternal reminder of our shared values, of the people and the purpose which make this nation great, and of all we can accomplish even when faced with seemingly impossible odds. This place will commemorate and preserve the stories of selfless service and sacrifice which will remain a source of inspiration for generations to come. This place, the National Medal of Honor Museum. Established in 1861, the Medal of Honor is our nation's highest award for valor in combat. More than 40 million brave individuals have served in the United States Armed Forces since the Civil War. Fewer than 4,000 have received the Medal of Honor. Those who received it will tell you they wear it not for themselves, but for all who they served alongside. Today, we salute these great patriots. 3,511 have received the honor. 66 are alive today. We are blessed to have so many of them with us here today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome those who have distinguished themselves conspicuously by gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of life above and beyond the call of duty. Please stand for America's Medal of Honor recipients. Today on this historic occasion, please welcome, from New Hampshire, National Medal of Honor Museum Foundation President and CEO, Chris Cassidy. From Texas, National Medal of Honor Museum Foundation Chairman, Charlotte Jones. From Pennsylvania, Chaplain Rear Admiral Margaret Brun Kibbett. General Joseph M. Martin. From Massachusetts, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark A. Milley. And from the great state of Texas, ladies and gentlemen, the 43rd President of the United States, George W. Bush and Mrs. Laura Bush. From 
Washington, D.C., please welcome author, anchor, chief Washington correspondent, and host for today's ceremony, Jay Tapper. Be seated. We are breaking ground today, so I've been thinking a lot about dirt. From the black soil plains of Nebraska to the red rock of Utah and the sea swept shores of Florida and Maine, the dirt is different, but the spirit of the United States of America is the same across this land. The individuals who were born atop this dirt and went on to earn the Medal of Honor left it behind. They left that dirt behind to follow a higher purpose, taking them to the dirt at combat outpost Keating in Nuristan province, Afghanistan, or atop Mount Suribachi at Iwo Jima. The dirt at the top of the sand dunes on the beaches of Normandy. The dirt at Chosen Reservoir. The dirt at Village Green in Concord. Even the dirt next to the rock wall of Gettysburg. So is all of this just Dirt? Maybe. But in these places, it represents so much more. The grounds of battle are made hallowed by the blood and sweat poured out into the dirt. Meanwhile, the grounds these brave patriots left behind at home are marked by the sacred tears of parents and grandparents praying for a hero's safe return or mourning a hero's passing. Today, we're here to dedicate this place, and in so doing, we will mark a, a transformation from simple dirt to hallowed and sacred ground. But as Abraham Lincoln once said, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who are remembered here, have already consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. Yes, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did. Today, 66 Medal of Honor recipients are living. 15 join us here today. Each one a living legacy whose story will have a permanent home on this national landscape in the National Medal of Honor Museum. And today we salute these Medal of Honor recipients and we celebrate the country we love and they so bravely, so selflessly served. Please stand for our national anthem to be performed by the United States Air Force Total Force Band. And please remain standing for the invocation to be offered today by Chaplain Navy Rear Admiral Margaret Grun Kibben.
Would you pray with me? Holy God, we ask you to bless this moment and make it sacred as the long-held desire to honor America's heroes appropriately comes to reality, as the hope for a monument that gives honor to their selfless sacrifice is fulfilled. We pause to ask you to be the foundation of this endeavor. You and the valor of the over 3,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen of this United States, who in the face of unimaginable circumstances upheld the highest virtues of honor, courage, and integrity. On their shoulders does our nation's freedom stand and this monument find its vision. So may every block and beam rise and step be strengthened by the bravery and dedication of those whose lives we honor today. May the construction of this museum serve well to tell the story of gallantry and intrepidity in the face of impossibility, resilience in the face of unspeakable adversity, that our compatriots would find hope in humanity and inspiration for their own contribution to the common good. Throughout this season of construction, may those who labor on this site be inspired by the purpose for which they contribute their time and talent. Grace them with the knowledge that they, in their own way, honor those who left homes just like theirs to serve a purpose far larger than themselves. Holy God, sanctify the future of this monument. May it reflect the spirit of America and the blessing you offer to those who give of their whole selves in their service to you and to this country. And God, bless America. In your name we pray. Amen. Every person is born with the potential to be extraordinary. Each of us, regardless of background or natural abilities, are blessed with a limitless well of courage. And when tapped, this courage empowers ordinary people to accomplish the incredible. The individuals who receive the Medal of Honor are an ever-present reminder of the potential within each of us to act in moments under pressure. They embody the valor the values, and the vision alive in us all. On behalf of a grateful nation, thank you. Medal of Honor recipients come from every branch of the military. Their names and faces are as diverse as America herself. First generation American recipients of the honor represent more than three dozen countries. Whether born into a family with a tradition of military service in Virginia or California, farmers in Iowa, or to a single mom in New York, recipients of the Medal of Honor come from every state in the nation, and though diverse in many ways, they are united in purpose and in sacrifice. For the past several months, friends and supporters of the museum, as well as family members of fallen service members, have been sending their state soil to Texas. Dirt from across the nation has arrived in bags and in boxes and jars and envelopes, each container bringing with it a story. And today, as we prepare to turn this dirt, our attending Medal of Honor recipients will unite our nation's soil with the Texas dirt, building a whole greater than the sum of its parts. 
just like this great nation. From the War on Terror, Master Chief Edward Byers, Toledo, Ohio. Corporal William Kyle Carpenter, Jackson, Mississippi. Staff Sergeant Salvatore Junta, Clinton, Iowa. Captain Florent Groberg, Poisse, France. Command Master Chief Britt Slabinski, Northampton, Massachusetts. Lieutenant Colonel William Swenson, Seattle, Washington. Sergeant Major Matthew Williams, Casper, Wyoming. From Vietnam, Colonel Donald Ballard, Kansas City, Missouri. Major General Patrick Brady, Phillips, South Dakota. Petty Officer Robert Ingram, Clearwater, Florida. Specialist 5th Class, James McLuhan, Southampton, Michigan. Command Sergeant Major Robert Patterson, Durham, North Carolina. Lieutenant Michael Thornton, Greenville, South Carolina. From the Korean War, Staff Sergeant Hiroshi Miramora, Gallup, New Mexico. From World War II, Chief Warrant Officer 4, Herschel Williams, Quiet Dell, West Virginia. Today's act of uniting soil becomes a physical and hallowed symbol of the way this project and support for the heroes behind it is uniting the country. And this will be our prayer, that this nation under God shall continue and that each of us will do our part to serve others over self. Potential without action is never realized. Action without purpose is meaningless. Within each of us, there must be a catalyst to transform potential into action. For Medal of Honor recipients, this catalyst was hardship, loyalty, and the crucible of combat. Honoring their extraordinary acts of valor pays tribute not only to the recipients, but also to the brothers and sisters in arms who they acted to protect. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the 20th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark A. Milley. Mr. President, thank you for being here and thank you for your great service. Uh, many of the Medal of Honor winners here uh, in the front row uh, served under your leadership and we all want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. There are many dignitaries here, and, and I won't single them all out, um, but I do want to say thank you to each and every one of you for being here today to celebrate what is a very, very important event, the opening of an incredible museum. There are thousands of people who contributed to putting this together, and so many more, many in this audience, will continue this hard work. So thank you all. Uh, for your leadership, your inspiration, and indeed your vision for bringing this to reality. And because of their efforts, we will soon have this Medal of Honor Museum deep in the heart of Texas, where the public can celebrate the spirit of the Medal of Honor and learn about the tremendous Americans who have received our nation's highest award for valor. And it is indeed a museum that will bring Americans together, as you just saw the pouring of soil from many of our states. Since it was established during the Civil War, 3,511 American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines have received the Congressional Medal of Honor. 66, as Jake Tapper pointed out, are still alive, and 15 of them have humbled us with their presence here today. Each of you is a living inspiration, not only to those of us who are still in uniform, but to our entire nation. In front of you are seven Medal of Honor recipients from Afghanistan, six from Vietnam, one from Korea, and one from Iwo Jima in World War II. Thank you so much for being here today with us. The National Medal of Honor Museum will enshrine the stories of our Medal of Honor recipients for future generations to come. And these stories of selfless service deserve a permanent home. And those stories will now live here in this museum. By shining a spotlight on the Medal of Honor at distinguished recipients that received it, the values they lived for and in many cases died for, visitors will come to understand the meaning and price of freedom and appreciate the virtue putting service before self. The museum will also include an education center aimed at character development in our nation's youth. A critical part of that mission will be to share the stories of Medal of Honor recipients to inspire our young people and motivate them to be their best. And valor, for sure, is about physical courage, as each recipient demonstrated. But it's more important, or just as important, is their moral courage. Valor must be selfless and involve great personal risk in order to save others, regardless of the cost to yourself. But words do not do justice to the concept of valor. We need the power of example, the example of Medal of Honor recipients, each in their own time and in their own way, personally demonstrating valor. You see that valor demonstrated and Major General retired Pat Brady, who retired as a Major General and served 34 years in the United States Army. He was commissioned as a Second Lieutenant in the Army Medical Service Corps in 1959, a year after I was born, and served in Berlin during the building of that wall. And he returned to the Berlin Wall in 1989 when it was torn down. And in between, he served in the, in the Dom Rep, the Dominican Republic, in 1965 and in Korea along the demilitarized zone. But it was really in Vietnam where Pat was a soldier of uncommon courage and commitment. During his first tour in Vietnam from January 64 to January 65, then Captain Brady served as an ambulance helicopter pilot with the 57th Medical Detachment. These Huey pilots, often flying under the call sign dust off, flew under the leadership of 
Major Charles Kelly, an infantry soldier turned pilot who never forgot what it felt like to be in a firefight and call for a rescue of helicopter. On 1 July 1964, when after being repeatedly warned away from a very hot and dangerous LZ, Major Kelly said, I will leave only when I have your wounded. Soon after that, Major Kelly was shot in the heart while he was flying. Major Charles Livingston Kelly became the 149th American to die in Vietnam. And his name is forever etched on a panel, one echo of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in DC. He is the father of dust off. And many, many Americans owe their lives to the concept that he created and personally led. And in a moment, Pat Brady lost his mentor, his friend, and found himself now as a detachment commander. The following day, a new commander showed up and tossed the bullet that Major Kelly was killed with on Pat's desk and asked then Captain Brady if they were going to stop flying so aggressively. Pat picked up the bullet and replied, we are. We are going to keep flying exactly the way Kelly taught us to fly, without hesitation, anytime, anywhere. That is moral courage. In his second tour of duty in Vietnam in 67 and 68, now Major Brady was second in command of the 54th Medical. On 6 January 1968, Pat volunteered to rescue wounded soldiers from a site in enemy-held territory which was heavily armed and blanketed with thick fog. Without hesitation, he accepted the harrowing mission, one after another, in treacherous weather, each time finding his way to the dangerous LZs to rescue the wounded. On this mission, he deliberately rolled his helicopter sideward to blow the fog away with the rotor wash, and amazingly, it worked. Pat landed where two other aircraft had been shot down, and many others were trying and failed to penetrate the fog. But Pat got through, with wounded American soldiers laying less than 50 meters away. Brady was the only one to get to them. And he came back, not once, not twice, not three times, but four times, four times, Major Brady went back into that hot LZ, and he successfully evacuated every single wounded American. And he kept going. On another mission, he and his crew rescued an isolated platoon of soldiers out on an enemy minefield. The mine detonated near Brady's helicopter, tearing through the aircraft and wounding two of his crew members. Yet he continued to fly, and he flew the wounded to their medical aid. And at the end of that day, his rendezvous with destiny, Pat had utilized three helicopters that had been destroyed while he was flying them to evacuate a total of 51 seriously wounded men who would, many would later die. The aircraft he flew that day had over 400, 400 bullet holes. Pat flew over 2,000 combat missions in Vietnam and successfully evacuated over 5,000 wounded during his two tours of duty. And Pat is the only living Army veteran of Vietnam to hold both the Medal of Honor and the Distinguished Service Cross, the nation's second highest award. Pat's story is incredible, simply incredible. And so is that of every Medal of Honor recipient these stories of heroism, service, and valor must be shared, and that's exactly what this museum will do. In a memoir he penned to his daughter, Megan, a veteran herself who followed in her father's footsteps as a medical officer, Pat described the mission in Vietnam and the legacy he protected for his fellow friend and mentor, Major Kelly. And he wrote, Kelly's position was simple. The others came first. The patient came before all else, and our mission was to protect and care for them and never to abandon them. It is precisely this spirit that will fill every corridor of this museum. And we cannot truly appreciate the sacrifice of our 
Medal of Honor recipients unless we see the weapons they used and feel the uniforms they wear and hear the stories they told and read the letters that they wrote. We will never feel our lungs suddenly hollow from the impact of artillery and shells on a hot Civil War battlefield like Mary Walker did. You and I will never fight through the haze and the mustard gas of the Meuse Argonne like Corporal Freddie Sowers did. We're not going to hear the whiz and the snap of Wehrmacht bullets while assaulting the last 100 yards of Omaha Beach like Private Carlton Barrett did. Or know the carnage and the assault on the landings at Iwo Jima like Corporal Woody Williams did, who's sitting here in the front row. We're not going to suffer the blistering cold of the Chosen Reservoir like William Barber, United States Marine Corps did, or the sweltering humid choke of South Vietnam jungles like Bob Patterson did. And it's here in this museum that you're going to hear about Petty Officer Ed Byers in a fierce firefight, or Kyle Carpenter sitting in the front row jumping on a grenade, or Flo Groberg who tackled a suicide bomber at almost certain death. And you'll hear about Slabinski and Swenson and Williams and all the rest of them who have served this country so proudly. But we can come here and we can see and hear those stories. It's those stories that will document our country's bravery, that gives purpose to our entire military. It's their heroism. And why do they do it? They did it for each other. They did it for their teammates. But they also did it for you and I and for a document called the Constitution, which is the North Star for all of us in uniform. It's that document that gives all of us purpose. It's that document that gives purpose to this museum. And we in uniform are willing to die, and our task is to pass it on to the next generation. And in it are the ideas and values that make this experiment that we call the United States of America. And we are unique amongst militaries. We don't take an oath to a king or a queen or a president. We don't take an oath to a dictator or a tyrant. We don't take an oath to an individual. We take an oath to an idea, the idea that is America. Every single one of us in uniform is willing to die for that idea. And that is what separates your military, our military, the American military, from every other military on Earth. We are willing to die for an idea. And it's been true across generations, and that's going to be true on display here in this great museum. It's a portal that will connect us to our past and cast a guiding light onto our future. This museum is a monument to the very best of our country. In the front row in front of us, all of us today, are representatives of the best that is America. The unparalleled valor of those who wear the cloth of this nation, who have guarded the wall and stood on the beach, defended Americans for 246 years. That spirit, that mission, that idea, the idea that is America is timeless. And the valor it takes to protect and defend this experiment in liberty, that too will live forever right here in this museum. Thank you all, and may God bless America. I do want to uh, take one note of a personal privilege um, because today is uh, Medal of Honor Day. Uh, March 25th is Medal of Honor Day nationally. And I want to note that it was on November 15th, 1990 when President George H.W. Bush signed National Medal of Honor Day into law. So uh, while the hero that it was your father is no longer with us, uh, his spirit lives on. And, and we want to just want to take that moment to, to acknowledge the Bush family for, for what <laughs> So 
Soldiers, service members believe that life has meaning when it is lived for the benefit of future generations. Stories of Medal of Honor recipients and all who they served alongside inspire us to be better and to do better. A self-described reluctant soldier, Major General Patrick Henry Brady was honored with our nation's highest military decoration for valor in 1969 from President Richard Nixon. Brady ha has flown uh, more than 2,500 combat missions and rescued more than 5,000 wounded. A true patriot, he is a, a role model for service and for sacrifice. His openness, his humility, despite his acclaim, is inspiring. Representing our country's Medal of Honor uh, recipients, past and present, please welcome Major General Patrick Brady. Thank you, thank you. I just really love to hear what a fine fellow I am. <laughs> I wish my wife could be here to hear what a fine fellow I am. But more than that, I wish my wife's mother could be here to hear what a fine fellow I am. I've got to find my spontaneous remarks. Now, don't alarm because I'm reminded of uh, what Henry VIII said to his fifth wife. I won't keep you long. <laughs> so, Mr. President, is that just getting to you? <laughs> Chairman Milley, I really appreciate uh, the general bringing out Charles Kelly because he was an incredible man. What he did continues to, to serve, and his, his dying words, when I have your wounded, set the standard for battlefield rescues to this day. He was an inspiration to all of us, and uh, we're gonna go to Vietnam in April, and we're gonna put a memorial on the spot where that great man was killed. Now, we're often asked why we did what we did. We did it for people like the Jones family, the Goff family, Don Arnell, Annette Simmons, and the great patriots we have here today. We don't believe we did America a favor by our service and sacrifice. We believe that God did us a favor by allowing us to be born in this great country among people like you. This museum. <laughs> this museum will trace our roots to Abraham Lincoln, the Civil War, on our rolls are names that will ever be a part of American history. Sergeant York, Charles Lindbergh, Douglas MacArthur, Teddy Roosevelt, Jimmy Doolittle, Eddie Rickenbacker, Mary Walker, Buffalo Bill, Audie Murphy, and of course, Pat Brady. <laughs> now, most recipients are obsessed with service. Chris, our CEO, he never stops talking about service. This museum will allow us to serve beyond our lives. It will highlight recipients' accomplishments as citizens, more important than what we did as soldiers. We are a family of Americans who not only defended our country, but we helped design and enrich it. These great blood donors to our freedom believe life has no meaning unless lived for the benefit of future generations. Now those generations will come to learn that it was a Medal of Honor recipient who first flew solo across, across the Atlantic, who first flew in the clouds using a gyro that opened the skies for commercial travel, who was the first commissioner of the American Football League, who were great athletes, won a president, politicians, Journalists, we had politicians. <laughs> Actors, builders who built our railroads, generals who fought our and won our wars, one who founded our park system. And we have prisoners as in POW and as in convict. It was a Medal of Honor recipient who composed TAPS, who, find it, who founded the CIA, and on and on. And I think it was a Medal of Honor recipient who's on Mount Rushmore who spoke what should be 
on the door to this museum. And he said, the lives of truest heroism are those in which there are no great deeds to look back upon. It is the little things, well done, that go out to make up a truly successful and heroic life. Heroism is interesting, but only valuable in as much as it is inspirational, that it inspires the values upon which this nation was built. And we will see in this museum the history of values told through our recipients. Young people will learn they can be heroes and they don't have to go to war to do it. This museum will be a vault for those values, the values embedded in this medal, courage, sacrifice, and patriotism. There's only three, not six. They screwed up on that airplane. <laughs> These are the pillars of American excellence. Valor is finite. Values are infinite. Is there another museum anywhere in the world that ties valor and inspires to teach values? Courage, of course, is the key to success in life. It's the only way in which we are all born equal. Faith is the foundation of courage. Fear is an emotion. Courage is a decision. Fear is actually a form of slavery, as we have seen. I've never known anyone with enduring, repetitive courage who was not also a person of faith. And you're going to find that, and I have found through these many years, that faith is very, very prominent among our recipients. Sacrifice, love and action, vital to happiness and leadership. And I believe that the capacity for sacrifice may be the ultimate measure of genuine human goodness. Patriotism. Many recipients would rather be called patriots than heroes. We realize that the medal we wear, we wear more because of the mercy and grace of Almighty God and the goodwill and support of our fellow troops than for anything we did as we struggled through the mist and the mess of combat. We know that what we did to earn the medal is less important than what we do with it. It does not make us special, but it does allow us to do special things, and there is nothing we have ever done that's more special than this museum. The bottom line is America cannot survive if our people are not patriots, this museum will inspire patriotism. It can change America. Strength is the key to peace, and there is no strength without our patriots. Peace is the ultimate victory of all warriors. And I think patriotism is best illustrated by a story we tell of a dear friend of mine. War, you guys get ready for a war story? You know the difference between a war story and a fairy tale? Fairy tale begins once upon a time. War story begins with this is no shit. <laughs> Webster was a great, powerful black soldier, an artillery sergeant. He was on a hill in Vietnam, an outpost, during a tropical storm. And the initial attack by the communists, they pretty much took off both his legs. Webster kept fighting. The initial attack, the secondary attack, they threw a hand grenade into his position, and Webster, when he was thrown it clear of his men, it pretty much took off his arm. He kept fighting. I flew in that night, and I picked up what was left of Webster and his wounded and took him to the hospital. Amazing. They saved his life but they did not save two legs and one arm. But it also earned the Medal of Honor. Webster and I became very close, and we would go about the country as all recipients do, talking to young people. And we were in a classroom in Oklahoma talking to some young people. And one young man raised his hand and he says, Mr. Anderson, knowing what you know now, that it would cost you two legs and one arm, would you do it again? And Webster, we, we had to prop him up there. He insisted on standing up when he was talking to the troops. He says, young man, I've only got one arm left, 
but my country can have it any time they want. Now, if that didn't embed in those young people what patriotism is all about, I don't know what will. And by the way, it's a great thrill for me today to be able to introduce to all of you Webster's nephew. This young man was raised by Webster after the war. Webster inspired him, as we hope our recipients will do, to a, to a, a life of military service. And he's here with his wife, Kathy. Stand up, Brian Freeman. Okay, God bless you guys. Get this damn thing done. We don't buy green bananas anymore. Many who receive the Medal of Honor made the ultimate sacrifice. The medal is awarded to them posthumously and presented by the President of the United States to parents, spouses, or even children of the fallen. Those unknowns who lay down their lives for freedom are also recipients of the Medal of Honor. We would also like to acknowledge Medal of Honor families, specifically those who represent recipients who are no longer with us. Many of these families are sharing their treasures with us by graciously contributing medals and other precious objects to the museum collection. Each of these items will help tell the full life story of their incredible loved ones. Today, to honor these fallen patriots, we welcome from Marine Barracks, Washington, D.C., the United States Marine Corps Silent Drill Platoon.
Ladies and gentlemen, the United States Marine Corps Silent Drill Platoon. <laughs> For most National Medal of Honor recipients, service did not end on the battlefield. Those who came home continued to serve their country, communities, and families, reminding us that what we do in a single moment of trial is indeed important, but how we live every day is what truly matters. Through this museum and the National Medal of Honor Institute housed on these same grounds, Medal of Honor recipients will continue to serve long after they are gone. Their legacies will provide examples of character and lessons in leadership, transforming all who they encounter. The National Medal of Honor Museum is on a mission to inspire the United States of America, and this, of course, begins with the next generation. We invited students from 6th through 12th grades throughout the country to write essays about what it means to live honorably and why we need people of honor in this world. Riley Gould is a junior at Fairland High School in Proctorville, Ohio. She and her mother join us today to share in this moment and share her winning essay, Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Riley Gould. When I am asked who I hold in high honor, my first thought is always the courageous, brave veterans. They risk their livelihood to protect the people of America. Honor to me is a necessity to give veterans. The soldiers of this country risk everything and die for the sake of the American people. My cousin, Sergeant First Class Matthew McClintock, was a Green Beret for the American Army. He was assigned to 1st Battalion, 19th Special Forces Group. <laughs> Sorry. Matthew went back into gunfire to allow a helicopter to land and save his injured team members. In that moment, he became selfless. <laughs> Honor to me is especially important because of this. I watched as the country mourned the death of my family member. January 5, 2016, forever changed my view on what honor meant to me and how it affected my everyday life. Because of what Matthew did, we were protected. Society needs honorable people to keep us protected. Without veterans and other honorable people, society would not recognize the importance of honor and what it means to be honorable. There is risk, selflessness, liability, danger, and love involved with honor. Society needs and will continue to need noble people to keep the peace. The self-sacrifice needed to be considered honorable is indescribable. My mother, Rebecca McClintock, works for a veteran hospital and shares with me the many stories of the brave veterans who stop and talk to her. She tells me that the veterans, if given the opportunity, would not change the fact that they went into the service. Our troops deserve so much for the amount of benevolence and generosity they possess. I would like to personally thank every single veteran for their sacrifice and let them know the honor they hold in my heart. We will forever be grateful.
We are a nation of values. They are the foundation of who we are and what we are always working harder to be. The Medal of Honor symbolizes the timeless American ideals of courage and sacrifice, commitment and integrity, citizenship and patriotism. At the National Medal of Honor Museum, these values will be celebrated and be a beacon of inspiration for generations to come. Ladies and gentlemen, the 43rd President of the United States, George W. Bush. Too hard to applaud too much. Uh, Riley, thank you for your words. If there's any doubt about our nation forgetting the sacrifices of people like Matthew, put it out of your mind, because that's what we're here to celebrate. I, uh, I appreciate uh, General uh, Milley for being here. It's a big deal when that many stars show up. <laughs> I also want to thank Admiral Kidman, General Martin, Appreciate your service, uh, and welcome to the other Arlington. That would be Texas. <laughs> and if you think the Pentagon was big, just walk across the street to AT&T. <laughs> uh, Charlotte, I want to thank you and the board of directors and the funders for the work you've done to help build this museum. I, uh, I congratulate you on choosing Chris Cassidy to lead it. Most of you don't know who Chris Cassidy is, and frankly, I didn't either until I met him. Uh, but he saw combat in Afghanistan as a SEAL. He became NASA's 14th chief astronaut. And I'm not so sure what's so, uh, more impressive about him. Those two uh, credentials are the fact that he had survived an interview with Charlotte Jones. <laughs> I want to thank members of Congress, distinguished guests, Tapper, who I hadn't seen in a long time. Uh, Laura and I are proud to join you. I bring greetings from my fellow honorary directors. I'm a little hesitant to put words in their mouth, but I can, I'm confident if Presidents Carter, Clinton, and Obama were here, uh, they would tell you that presenting the Medal of Honor is one of the great privileges of being president. President Harry Truman said he'd rather have earned the Medal of Honor than be the Commander in Chief. And I think General Brady was probably there to hear him say that. It's the highest military decoration a president can confer. It's awarded for gallantry in the face of danger, actions above and beyond the call of duty, and courage so great that no one could rightly expect to muster. The tradition of awarding this honor began in the Civil War. Many who received it uh, gave their lives. Uh, today, the families who are here, Laura and I, Ask for God's blessings, continued blessings on you. Fifteen of the living members are here. I want to thank you all for being here and thank you for continued work. When you look at the Medal of Honor recipient, you're looking at someone who has demonstrated gallantry under impossible odds. You're looking at someone who's placed duty above self. You're looking at someone who understands the meaning of sacrifice in the most profound way. And you're looking at a person of integrity, fortitude, and patriotism. You're looking at honor. And these values must be preserved, protected, and passed on to future generations. And that is why the National Medal of Honor Museum is so important. During my time in office, I had the privilege of presiding over nine Medal of Honor ceremonies. You know, I really don't miss much about being president. I mean, I miss being pampered. <laughs> Air Force One, <laughs> constant desserts. <laughs> but I tell you what, Laura and I miss. We miss being with military, the military and their families. That's why at SMU we spend a lot of time helping our vets transition from military life to civilian life, with a particular emphasis on post-traumatic stress and dramatic, dramatic brain injuries. I, uh, but one of the cool things about hanging out with vets is you get to meet some extraordinary ones and two of the Medal of Honor recipients who are here today, I got to know. Salvatore 
Junta. 2003, Sal was getting ready to graduate from John F. Kennedy High in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, when he heard they were giving away T-shirts at the Army recruiting post. Sal decided to forego the T-shirt and wear our uniform. As he said, this is my chance and I can make a difference, and he was right. During Sal's first deployment in Afghanistan in 2005, he got shot in the leg. In 2007, he went back to Afghanistan, and that's where his unit came under fire from insurgent forces. His squad leader got hit, and Sal charged forward toward the ambush and rescued him. He administered medical relief by taking on fire and engaging the enemy. After he got his squad leader safe to safety, he rushed back toward the fight to save more wounded Americans. For putting his brothers in arms above his own safety, he received the Medal of Honor. We met a few years ago at the Bush Institute's Warrior Open Golf Tournament. He's got a decent swing, <laughs> but clearly he's more skilled at shooting a rifle than he is hitting a golf ball. <laughs> Sal continues to serve our nation today in a perilous post. He recently went back to school and graduated with a degree in Supply chain management. <laughs> Proud to be with you, Sal, and thank you for your service. <laughs> Florent Groberg is here. It's kind of hard to call a man Florent after he has won the Medal of Honor. So I just went with Flo. That'd be F L O W. He grew up uh, outside of Paris, France, and came to the United States at age 11. In other words, he wasn't born in this country. He embraced our country. He worked hard. He excelled in academics and athletics. And after graduating from the University of Maryland, he enlisted in the U.S. Army. Following the 9-11 attacks, there was no other choice for me, he said. Flo completed airborne ranger schools, deployed to Afghanistan with the 4th ID as a platoon leader. August 8, 2012, a suicide bomber approached Captain Groberg's formation, which included several high-ranking military officials. Flo ran straight at the threat. He pushed the bomber away from the group before the bomb could detonate. His selfless courage saved the lives of members of his group, including the colonel he had been assigned to protect. The explosion severely wounded him and several of his comrades. To this day, Flo wears a bracelet with the names of the four souls who did not survive the attack. When he received the Medal of Honor at the White House, he asked President Obama to recognize those individuals and invite their families. The brotherhood could not be broken. He wakes up every morning thinking about him. He's a reminder that many of our greatest citizens and most distinguished service members were not born in the United States. Some 3,500 individuals have been recognized with the Medal of Honor. More than 700 of those medals have gone to immigrants. When I recently painted Flo's portrait, by the way, it's a face only a mother could love. <laughs> I painted a man I'm proud to call my fellow American. By sharing the stories of men like Flo and Sal, this museum will give Americans a deeper understanding of what's important. Patriotism, courage, duty, and service. Visitors will come away with a new appreciation of what it means to sacrifice and what it means to live in a free land. You know, during these turbulent times, people ask me, am I worried? And my answer is no. I'm optimistic about the future because for so long as we emulate the virtue and the character of the people we honor, we're going to be just fine. And that's what the National Museum of Honor does. It emulates excellence. I want to thank you all for being here. God bless America. Ladies and gentlemen, from Annapolis, Maryland, the U.S. Naval Academy Glee Club.
from the bravest of the brave whom we honor with this mission to the generous supporters, founders, and the leaders who have breathed life into this dream, to the families who have entrusted their keepsakes and treasures to these collections, and to our honorary directors who served our nation as commanders in chief, thank you all for being here today. With this action, we continue the enduring work of inspiring America and creating a more perfect union. Ladies and gentlemen, on this 25th day of March, in the very heart of our incredible nation, we now set hand to shovel and break ground on this historic project.